G'day everyone, in this video we're going to start creating our enemies. This topic will cover the next few videos and we'll implement the player shooting mechanic at the same time. First up, we're going to create our own finite state machine and write a basic patrol state so our enemies can move around the map. Before that, I just want to start by saying a huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed to my channel, joined the Discord and have been watching my videos. If you've made it this far in the series, then you're doing an awesome job. Things may start to get a little bit more difficult from here on, but I'll try and explain everything clearly so that you understand the process. So since the last video, I've brought in some props just to liven up the scene. I think it's good to add in some simple art as we go, just so we can get an idea of how the final level will look and to help us keep inspired. Making a game is a long journey and we need to stay excited during the process. Bringing in some artwork can really help keep that excitement in the early stages of development. I've also expanded the second room here. In this room, we're gonna create our enemy. So I'm gonna very quickly create a placeholder enemy out of cubes and spheres. Now in this series, we're using a state machine to create enemies. However, with some tweaks to the game logic, you can use this framework to create NPCs as well. Instead of trying to hurt the player, maybe you want them to follow the player and hurt enemies instead. Alrighty, so this is Qbert. Right now, Qbert doesn't know anything and they can't do anything. But by the end of this video, we're gonna have Qbert moving around our map and following a path. Now, I want you to keep in mind that we don't need an advanced sentient AI to make our agents seem smart. The goal when designing any AI for games is to ensure that our agents make appropriate decisions for their current situation. If an agent's health is low, then they should probably flee and heal themselves or if an enemy loses sight of the player, then they should go searching around where their player was last spotted. When our agents fail to make good choices, then it breaks that illusion of intelligence for our players. So Unity comes with some really great options out of the box to create AI agents. In terms of the Unity editor, there's only a few things that we need to get an agent to navigate our map. We'll need some geometry, and this can be a model that we import, or it can be the Unity terrain, well, for this example, I'm just going to use a cube. Then using that geometry, we can bake a navigation mesh. This will turn our level into a navigable area. And finally, we'll need to add a nav mesh agent component onto our agent. So with qubit selected, we'll head over to the inspector and we'll type in nav mesh and we'll click nav mesh agent. This component uses a navigation mesh to move qubit around the level. Let's set up a nav mesh now. We'll head up to window, AI navigation, and I'll open up a new window over our inspector. Make sure that we're on the object tab and with the floor geometry selected, we can assign this to navigation static. This means that the object will be included when we go to bake our nav mesh. So to do that, we'll head over to the bake tab and in here, we've got a few different options which affect how our nav mesh turns out. When we hit bake, you can see that a blue overlay appears on the floor. This is our navigation mesh. It's what our nav mesh agent uses to determine what areas can be traversed. So to show you what a few of these settings do, if we head over and look at the edge of the geometry and increase the agent radius and hit bake again, you can see that the distance from the edge of the geometry has increased. We grab our floor geometry and duplicate it. Then rotate it slightly. Hit bake again. And our nav mesh now includes the second geometry. But if I rotate this past the max slope angle, which is 45 degrees and bake once more, then it's not included anymore. So again, these values just affect how the navigation mesh is baked. The default values work pretty well, so I'm gonna undo everything and hit bake once more, but you may wanna change these for your game. Now there are two more tabs up in the navigation window. We've got agents, and I did some research on this and I believe that you need the nav mesh components package installed from GitHub in order to use this. So we're not gonna cover that in this video, but basically, if we had multiple types of agents that required different parameters for traversal, then we can set that up here. And the other tab is areas. 
And in here, we can create different surface types and assign them each a different cost that will influence what path our agents choose to take. I can explain this in more depth in a later video if people want, but right now it's not too relevant. So with that, we've finished all of the setup. We've got our nav mesh agent component on Qubit. We've got our geometry. And from that, we've baked a navigation mesh. Keep in mind that the navigation mesh will only display when the navigation window is open. Alrighty, so we'll return to the editor in a moment, but now let's quickly talk about finite state machines. Basically, a finite state machine is a framework which allows an object to exist in a single state. An object will have a finite number of states that it can move to and exist in, and the transition between these states depend on certain conditions. The Unity Animator window is an example of a state machine that controls the animations of a character. If you've ever worked with the Unity Animator before, then you'll be familiar with how a state machine works. In the animator, we could have an idle animation, which is the initial and default state of our character. Then if the player's movement speed is greater than zero, we could have a condition that triggers a transition to the walking state. The state machine that we're creating in this video will control the game logic of our enemy. Each state will be broken up into its own script and will have a centralized state machine to act as Qubit's brain. So let's look at a flowchart demonstrating how Qubit should behave. For this video, we're only going to focus on setting up the framework of our state machine and creating the patrol state. This will be the default behavior. Then over the next few videos, we'll return to this flowchart and gradually build on more states so that Qubit can react appropriately to their environment and current situation. Now, the next example is a high level and simplified UML diagram, which demonstrates the structure and relationships of our classes. We'll start by looking at the enemy class. In here, you can see that it has an instance of a state machine. And there'll be a lot of other variables and functions here, but just for simplicity's sake, this is all that we need to know for now. So every enemy will have their own state machine, which again is like the brain of the enemy. Moving down and looking at the state machine class, this class knows which state is currently active. It holds references to all of the potential states for this particular enemy, and it controls the transitions between these states. The state machine class will contain an instance of our base state class, which will be the currently active state. And in this variable, we can pass in any state that inherits from base state. At the moment, we're just going to focus on patrol state, but we'll also have the attack state and search state and so on. Now the base state has variables for our enemy and our state machine class. This is so our state knows which enemy is currently using this particular instance of it and can update the state machine accordingly. A state will have three functions, enter, perform, and exit. And these functions will contain all of the logic that needs to be executed when the state is active. Then we've got the patrol state. This will include the three functions from our base state class, as well as any specific variables and functions that are needed for that particular state. So our patrol state will have a patrol cycle function and it will contain all of the variables that are needed to run that logic. So now let's get into some code. Start by creating our base state class. So we'll head to our scripts folder, create a new folder called enemy. And in here we'll have a new folder called states. This folder, let's create a new C sharp script called base state. Now let's select everything and delete it. We're going to create a new public abstract class and we'll call this base state. This is going to contain an instance of our enemy class and an instance of our state machine class. Under that, we wanna add the three functions. The first function is public abstract void called enter. And because it's an abstract function, we don't declare a body. We can just close that off with a semicolon. Next one is public abstract void form and public abstract void exit. 
So the names of these functions kind of suggest in what order they'll be called. But let's run through and look at each one. We'll use the enter function kind of like how we use mono behaviors start. In here, we'll set up any game properties that we need to. Perform will be the update of our state. It will get called every frame when the state is active. In here, we can process and monitor all of the logic that we need in real time. Exit will be called on the active state before we change into a new state. In this section, we can carry out all of the necessary cleanup. So we'll save that and we'll head back into Unity. We'll head back into our enemy folder and create a new C -sharp script called State Machine. Now, finite state machines are a very basic example of automata theory. And there are many different implementations at varying levels of complexity. We're only going to be scratching the surface of this topic, but again, as long as our AI makes appropriate decisions, then it shouldn't look stupid. So our first step in here is to create a property for the active state that the enemy is currently in. This is going to be a public base state. And we'll call this active state. Under that, we'll want a property for the patrol state when we create it. Now let's head down and make a new function to change between states. Public void, change state. This is going to take a base state as the parameter. We'll call that new state. First up in here, we want to check to see if the active state is not equal to null. So if active state is not equal to null, that means a state is already being executed and we want to run the cleanup on that state. So active state dot exit. After we've run the cleanup, we want to change into a new state. Active state is equal to new state. Hold on, I'll make the text a bit bigger. Then after we've changed to the new state, we want to do another null check. And in here, we'll set up the new state. So now that we've got our state machine class, let's save that. Head back into our base state class. And we'll create a public state machine. We'll call this state machine with a lowercase s. Save that and head back into the state machine class. And we can assign our active state dot state machine to equal this. After that, we'll want to assign our state's enemy class and then call active state dot enter. Now we'll head into the update function. We'll do another null check on our active state. And if our active state is not equal to null, then we want to call active state dot perform. So there are our three functions that we're going to be using for our states. Every time we call the change state function, we'll make sure that we're not currently running a state. If we are, we'll run the cleanup on that state. Then we'll change into the new state that we're passing in through the new state parameter. And then we'll run the setup on our new active state. So we'll save that. We'll head back into Unity. And then we'll create a new c -sharp class called enemy. Now, first up, we want a private reference to our state machine. Call this state machine with a lowercase s. Then at the top, we want to make sure that we're using Unity Engine dot AI. And that'll give us access to create a private nav mesh agent. I can just call this agent with a lowercase a. Then underneath that, we want to create a getter for this agent. So public nav mesh agent agent with a capital A. Then inside some curly brackets, we'll type in get, and then we'll create a pointer towards the agent with a lowercase a. Next, we'll create a private string, and we'll call this current state. We'll serialize this by giving it the serialize field header so that it's visible in the inspector. And this is just for debugging purposes. Now down in start, we'll assign our state machine to equal get component state machine. And we'll assign our agent to equal get component have mesh agent. 
Now, I did forget something in the state machine class, so we'll head back into there. And we want to create a new public void function called initialize. We won't actually implement this yet. We'll do this after we create our patrol state. But basically, we're just going to set up the default state in this function. And we want to make sure that we call this in start on our enemy class. So state machine dot initialize. Now we can head back into our base state class, take away this comment of instance of the enemy, and we can type in public enemy and call it enemy with a lowercase e. Alrighty, so we'll save all of our classes. We're almost at the point where our agent will be able to move around our map. Next, we need to create a path for them to follow. So we'll head back into Unity, create a new C -sharp script, and we'll call this path. This class is going to contain a public list of transform. We'll call this waypoints. This is equal to a new list of transform. And the order in which we add our waypoints to this list will determine the order that our enemies will travel to them. Now that we've created our path script, we can head back into our enemy class and create a public path. And we'll just call this path with a lowercase p. So we'll head back into Unity and we'll create a new path. We'll create an empty game object, call this path. Make sure that this has got a label on it. Make the label blue. Add the path component. Under our path game object, we want to create an empty child. Call it waypoint. We'll give this a blue diamond label. I spelled waypoint wrong. So for now, let's just add four waypoints and we'll do one on each side of our path game object. Now, if we select the path game object, we can move all of those at once. So we'll get them nice and close to the ground and we'll head back into the script and save it. That'll allow us to add the waypoints to our waypoint list lock the inspector and we'll drag all four of our waypoints into the waypoints list. Now the last script we're gonna create, we'll head back into the states folder, create a new c -sharp class and we'll call this patrol state. So we'll delete start and update and we want patrol state to inherit from base state, which will give us an error underneath the class name. And that's because we need to implement all of the abstract methods. We can type in public override void. One enter. And we can override the enter function. Then we can copy and paste this for form. And exit. All right, so at the bottom of the class, we'll create a new public void function. And we'll call this patrol cycle. And in here, we're going to implement our patrol logic. So at the top of the class, we'll want a public int and we'll call this waypoint index. And we'll use this to track which waypoint we are currently targeting. So back down in the patrol cycle function, we'll start off with an if statement. We'll go if enemy dot agent and agent is the public getter that we've set here. So we can access this from other classes. So if our agent dot remaining distance is less than 0 0.2, then we want to make sure that our waypoint index is less than our enemy dot path dot waypoints dot count minus one. If it's less than that, then we are free to increment the waypoint index. Else we've reached the end of the number of available waypoints. So we can reset our waypoint index back to zero. Lastly, we want to call enemy.agent.setDestination. 
to our enemy.path.waypoint because this is a list we want to pass in the square brackets here, our waypoint index. Then we'll need to convert this to a vector three because it's a list of transforms. We can just call waypoint index dot position. And we want to make sure we're calling our patrol cycle function inside of perform here. Now the last bit of code that we need to do is head back to our state machine class and set up our default state. But we want to create a property for our patrol state, so public patrol state, call this patrol state with a lowercase p. And then in the initialize function, we want to set patrol state to equal a new instance of patrol state. And then we'll just call change state and pass in that new instance. Down in our change state function, because we've finished writing our enemy class, we can now assign this active state dot enemy is equal to get component because they both exist on the same game object. Alrighty, so saving all of our scripts, heading back into Unity, we'll select Qubit, add on our enemy class and a state machine class. And we'll drag our path into the path slot. And if we hit play, we can see that Qubit is heading to each of these waypoints. Let's move one over here, move one over there. And we can start laying out a path for Qubit to travel. He's traveling to each waypoint a little bit too quick. He's not pausing at any of the waypoints. So if we head back into our patrol state class and at the top of the class, we want to create a new public float. We'll call this wait timer. Then down in our patrol cycle function in the first if statement, type in wait timer plus equal to time dot delta time. And then we'll type if wait timer is greater than three. Then we'll wrap all of this inside of this if statement. And then we'll reset our wait timer after we set the destination. Now, I also noticed that Qubit walked right through one of the pillars just then. So let's set up our level and make these pillars an obstacle that our agents will factor in. So if we select all of our pillars and our walls, and we add on a nav mesh obstacle component. And the inspector doesn't look right if it's too narrow. So we'll expand this out here and we'll hit the carve checkbox here. And then we select the navigation tab and look at the nav mesh. We can see that each of the pillars have been cut out and are no longer included as a walkable area. And the agent radius we set earlier will affect these margins as well. Now in the description, you'll find a download for the path script, which has had some additions that will draw lines between each of the waypoints and number them. So I'll just head into the path script and I'll paste in the additional code. I'll save that and head back into Unity. Now, if we go and look at our path game object, we've got some extra variables in the inspector here. You can see that it's drawing lines between each of the waypoints and we've got an option to draw as a loop. We've got the option to draw numbers on each of the waypoints. Now the gizmos do kind of get in the way, so you can disable them if you want to, but I'm just gonna leave them enabled for now. And we've got an option to always draw the path. So even when we deselect the game object, the path will still be drawn. One final setting we have is that we can change the color, the path and the numbers. So this will help us visualize and lay out the paths for our enemies. So I'll just quickly lay out a path here. And we'll put this straight through the wall so we can see that the nav mesh obstacle is working correctly. So I'll make this full screen and we'll test it out again. We can see that Qubit moves to position one, waits for three seconds, then moves to position two. Let's see if he's going to avoid this wall here. Yep, so the nav mesh obstacles are working fine. Then he'll finish up by heading to the last waypoint and start the loop over again. Alrighty, so we've set up the foundations for our finite state machine and created a basic patrolling behavior. That's all we're gonna cover in this video. 
With what we've learned, you can easily set up a scene like this with multiple agents running around and following their own paths. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay up to date with the series, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.